This is Edward October, host of October Pod on YouTube. Hear that jingle jingle? It could be Kris Kringle, or a home invader looking for an open window, a jilted lover looking for revenge, or a disgruntled co-worker hoping to spike your eggnog with arsenic. The girls of our true crime podcast are always on Santa's nice list, but the crimes they discuss are very naughty indeed. Listener discretion is advised. Hey, Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. It's the second day of Christmas. Day two. Day two. Day, day two. Second day of Nightmare Before Christmas, I should there you add. Go. Yeah. There you go. I know. I can't believe it's happening already. It's just it's unreal. T- t- 10 days out, give or take, for the I know. big uh, holiday. For the big Woo! day when Santa Claus comes down our chimneys. Sanity Claus comes yep. down the chimney. I'll All tell right. you what. Well, I'm excited. Let's go. All right. Ready? Mm hmm. In November of 1986, 55-year-old Margaret Eby lived a rich and full life as a music professor at the University of Michigan. Margaret was well-liked by her students and co-workers and had several grown children of her own. She came from a family who valued education and were gifted in science. One brother worked for NASA, another was a psychiatrist, and one was a plastic surgeon. Smart. I don't know. But Margaret? She favored the arts. And wanting to share the passion with others, she became a teacher. She got her master's in music in 1962 and her doctorate in 1971. In 1984, she took a position at the University of Michigan Flint and went on to organize the Basically Bach Classical Music Festival in the Flint, Michigan area. Located about 70 miles west of Lake Huron in mid-Michigan, Flint, known as Vehicle City, was centered around the auto industry. And in the middle of Flint is a beautiful estate known as Applewood, which was once owned by the Mott family and is now opened to the public. Now, little side note here, when I first said, oh, Applewood, the Mott family, I'm thinking of apple juice, right? And what I was thinking of, like Mott's applesauce? Nope, nope, it wasn't. It is the Mott family, this Mott family, I should say, is Charles Mott, whose company was the largest Axle manufacturer in the world. Oh. Remember, because it's Michigan cars. Uh, yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right? So there, I was a little confused at first. I was but, thinking applesauce too. Uh, yep. So that's because we're always hungry, Camille. <laughs> <laughs> <I guess. laughs> anyway, there, Margaret Eby rented the former gardener's cottage and enjoyed quiet days filled with beautifully green landscaped views in the summer and untouched blankets of snow in the winter. Around 4.30 in the afternoon on November 9th, 1986, some of Margaret's students arrived at the cottage to take her to a concert. It was a mostly cloudy afternoon with temperatures just hovering at freezing and the sun was setting fast. Margaret should have met them at the door. The house should have been aglow with warm light. But when the students knocked on the door, they were met with silence. Had they gotten the wrong day? Margaret didn't mention any change of plans, so she should have been there and she should have answered the door. The students knocked again. Finally, one of them tried the doorknob and it was unlocked. They entered the cottage and found a grisly scene. Margaret Eby had been brutally raped, stabbed, and nearly decapitated. Margaret Eby was Flint, Michigan's 56th homicide that year. Spread thin and worked to the bones, police were determined nonetheless to find Margaret's killer. However, the leads dried up quickly. Margaret had no enemies, no jealous ex-boyfriends, and no known stalkers. That led police to believe that the murder was done by a stranger, and most murder victims are killed by people they know. According to the FBI website and Psychology Today, stranger killings account for less than 10% of all murders in the U.S. And not only is it uncommon to be murdered by a stranger, but it's also the most difficult crime to solve. And while DNA was left at the scene of Margaret's murder, 
DNA science was in its infancy at the time, and there was no national database where DNA results were entered and matched across the country. A bloody thumbprint was left on the handle of the faucet in Margaret's bathroom. It also didn't match any of the fingerprints on file in the state. And the IFAS, which stands for Integrated Automated Fingerprint Identification System, didn't exist at the time, and the print was not sent to the separate FBI database. So with no new leads and the forensics evidence exhausted, investigators regretfully had nothing else to go on. And the murder of Margaret Eby, while still ongoing, had screeched to a standstill. Five years later, in February of 1991, in a Romulus, Michigan hotel room, the wake-up calls from the front desk went unanswered. A 41-year-old flight attendant, Nancy Jean Ludwig from Minnetonka, Minnesota, had checked into room 354 around 9 p.m. the night before. Nancy had been a flight attendant for Northwest Airlines since 1976 and enjoyed her job quite a bit. What she didn't enjoy doing was working standby reserve, meaning she was on standby, ready to take a shift if another crew member called in sick or couldn't make their flight at the last minute. Her flight from Las Vegas, Nevada, had landed at Detroit Metropolitan Airport at 7.51 p.m. that evening, and she had taken the shuttle from the airport to a nearby Hilton, which had a contract to accommodate the airline employees. Anywhere from 165 to 180 flight crew stayed in that hotel per day. That's a lot of people. Yes, it is. From a plane. Well, planes, I should say. The security in the hotel left much to be desired. Because so many airline employees stayed there, the hotel just gave a list of which crew members were supposed to be in which room lying on the front desk. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, no. Right? The employee would find their name on the list and sign in. So this also meant that anybody could see which room any particular crew member would be staying in and whether or not they had already checked in. Mm. How dangerous Mm -mm. is that? Mm Mm-mm. Nancy Ludwig was not the type of person who was easily intimidated. Known as energetic, dynamic, and fearless, she married Art Ludwig, a television business executive for Minneapolis Television 12 years earlier. Art had six children from a previous marriage, and Nancy took on her job as stepmom with the same can-do attitude as she did everything else. Later, the hotel manager would say that the flight crew often didn't answer their wake-up calls, So nobody thought much of the fact that Nancy had not answered the phone. And because she was flying on standby, none of the other crew members on the flight that Nancy was supposed to take the next day even knew she was supposed to be there. Which is scary in itself. scary. Housekeeping at the hotel had not cleaned Nancy's room first thing in the morning because of the do not disturb sign on her door. But once noon rolled around, the time that Nancy should have been checked out by, Housekeeping let themselves in. It was about 12.50 in the afternoon when the housekeeper opened the door to the pitch black room. The curtains were closed and the lights were not working, so the housekeeper walked over to the window and, upon opening the curtains, turned around and discovered Nancy Ludwig lying on the bed. She was covered in smeared blood and stab wounds. Her hands were bound behind her back and her throat had been slit from ear to ear. There were defensive wounds all over her hands where she tried to fight off her attacker. The startled housekeeper stared in horror at the blood all over the carpet and white sheets and then ran for help. Police arrived on the scene and determined that not only had Nancy's attacker taken a shower after he killed her, but he had also wiped out her body with a hotel towel. The television had been left on CNN showing coverage of the Gulf War. The killer had also taken all the personal items that had belonged to Nancy, including her airline ID. And even though he had cleaned up, investigators were able to recover DNA from the crime scene. I mean, this man even took her uniform. Souvenirs? Weird, I'm assuming so. Investigators interviewed hotel employees and fellow flight crew. One flight attendant said that she had ridden on the shuttle from the airport to a hotel with Nancy the night before. She said that there had only been three people on the shuttle. She, Nancy, and a man about 40 to 45 years old. And the man had made a point of sitting right next to Nancy, even though there were plenty of other open seats on the shuttle. Mm. Two hotel employees said that they saw a man leaving the hotel around 10.15 p.m. 
This struck him as odd since 10.15 p.m. is when people should be checking in the hotel, not checking out. They witnessed him stuffing burgundy luggage, which happened to be the same color of luggage that Nancy had with her on that trip, into a trunk of a bronze or gold Monte Carlo. He also had what looked like an airline uniform tucked under his arm. A composite sketch of the man was released to the press. Art Ludwig was absolutely devastated by the death of his wife, Nancy. And by all accounts, she was the love of his life, and he absolutely adored her. He was determined not to let her case fall out of the limelight. And like most people in this situation, he wanted his wife's killer brought to justice. So he used his years of working at the television station to his advantage. He asked for favors and managed to get Nancy's story told on popular TV shows at the time, like Inside Edition and Current Affairs. Loved those shows. Are they even still on? I don't think they are, are mm, they? Syndicated Inside Edition is. Or maybe Current Affairs is Cable not. now? Maybe just or YouTube no, or something? I don't know. Yeah. The airline, Art Ludwig, and several others put money up for a reward. It started at $50,000 and eventually made its way up to 75000 which nowadays doesn't sound like a lot, but back then, it's a you lot know, now. it was a lot. Now, it's the equivalent of $169,000, $170,000. That's a lot. It is a lot. Art visited the hotel room where Nancy was murdered, hoping to understand what happened. Or maybe, even naively, hoping to find a clue of some kind of evidence that the police had overlooked. He simply couldn't understand how, with a big reward, nobody had come forward with any information. He failed to understand that the perpetrator of this crime was extremely paranoid and careful. He wasn't about to tell anybody what he had done. Ludwig soon ran into the same issue Margaret Eby's family had. This was most likely a stranger killer. There was no surveillance footage and nothing other than DNA was left at the crime scene. And DNA is only good if there's something to compare it to. And again, at the time, there was no national database for it to be entered into anyway. CODIS would not be fully operational until 1998, and genetic genealogy, where a match to a suspect's DNA is connected through relatives on a genealogical website, of course we know, didn't exist yet. And so Nancy Ludwig and Margaret Eby's case went cold. Within weeks of Nancy's death, Art Ludwig received a startling and unusual letter in the mail. It was from Mark Eby, the son of Margaret Eby. In the letter, Mark detailed his mother's murders to Art and concluded that he thought maybe, just maybe, his mother and Art's wife's cases were linked. Maybe they were committed by the same individual. I'm going to say yeah. Especially since we're discussing it on the same Mm -hmm. episode, right? Yep. Because we're smart like that. Anyway. Art agreed that it was a possibility. The bodies of the two women were found in the same position, and the crime scenes overall were very similar. So Art gave the letter to the Romulus police, who contacted the Flint, Michigan investigators to see what they thought. However, the police in Flint said that their suspect had type O blood, and the person who killed Nancy had type A. Furthermore, the DNA sample from Margaret was so small that investigators were concerned that a test comparison to a sample from Nancy would use up all the DNA from Margaret's case. So then if a perpetrator were ever caught, there wouldn't be any DNA left to test against him. So Flint and Romulus police departments didn't seem to think that there was any reason to pursue this line of investigation any further. Romulus investigators also uploaded the details of Nancy's case to VICAP, the Violent Crime Apprehension Program run by the FBI. It works in a similar fashion to the CODIS and IASIF databases. If any other crime in the country had a similar or identical MO, it would be flagged. But unfortunately, the details of Margaret Eby's case were never submitted to the FBI. This is yet another reason why these two cases were never linked. 
That is, until 2001, when the police departments in Michigan began reviewing cold cases and taking advantage of new technological advances. Flint police sent the DNA from Margaret Eby's file to CODIS, and within minutes, it linked the two cases together. The same person who killed Margaret Eby killed Nancy Ludwig. At this time, both cases also matched the VICAP. In September of 2001, the investigators finally sent the bloody fingerprint off to the FBI to see if there was a match in the nationwide database of APHIS. They had to wait months to get the results back because the FBI was overloaded. Why? Because the terrorist attack of 9-11 had just happened, and they had to focus most of their energy on that. And then, almost five months later, in February of 2002, the FBI matched the fingerprint from the EB crime scene to that of Jeffrey Wayne Gordon, who now lived in Genesee County with his wife and two kids. Gordon definitely had a criminal record, and while it was disturbing, it did not indicate the level of violence he was capable of. So in 1983, while stationed in Orlando, Florida, in the Navy, Gordon was convicted of robbery and burglary. In April that year, on two consecutive days, Gordon attacked two women, knocked them down, and wrestled their slips off them. Slips, like the lingerie that you wear under dresses? Yeah? He pulled them off of them (laughs) and ran away. Oh. Yeah. Orlando police began working with the Navy investigators to uncover more issues. There's a lot of issues here, let me tell you. Yeah, there, mm-hmm. At the time, Gordon lived in the trailer park with his first wife, Dawn, and their baby. The owner of the trailer park told authorities that he had entered Gordon's trailer and found dozens of pairs of women's underwear, including those of his own wife and daughter. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Gordon mm. pleaded guilty to those crimes. The judge sentenced him to four years in prison. But... Gordon only served two of those four years, and then after that, he moved back to Michigan after he was released. That conviction meant that his fingerprints would be put on file. When a burglary is committed to gather items for sexual purposes, and the burglar deliberately trespasses on somebody else's property, it is considered a fetish burglary, which I didn't know. Of course, I never really went to look into that much. (laughs) Gordon's behavior fit that to a T. The fact that he would sometimes take the undergarments off women in broad daylight showed a level of dedication that isn't usually encountered, and he wasn't afraid to commit physical assault. Even if the individuals were left physically unharmed, it crossed a boundary line that most fetishes won't cross. Investigators wanted to ensure their case was as airtight as possible, so they began following Gordon, hoping to get a DNA sample to put with the thumbprint. Gordon might be able to argue that the thumbprint ended up in Margaret's bathroom by some innocent means, but the DNA he wouldn't be able to explain away. It would be a one-two punch that would bring him down. While at the skating rink on February 7th with his kids, Gordon enjoyed a soft drink and left the styrofoam cup on the table, right? Mm -hmm. Undercover police swooped in and gathered the discarded trash. The saliva left by Gordon matched the semen in the case of Nancy Jean Ludwig and Margaret Eby. When officers showed up at his house in Vienna Township in Genesee, Michigan, officers said Gordon seemed genuinely surprised. Investigators found a 1982 gold Monte Carlo at his residence, just like the one that had been described in the Hilton Hotel more than 10 years before. Police also found over 800 pieces of women's lingerie in Gordon's residence, all meticulously labeled with tags that said who had owned the lingerie and where and when Gordon had stolen it. The officers were overwhelmed by all the evidence. I mean, they had boxes on top of boxes of evidence. And it didn't take long for the authorities to come across a box of VHS tapes. Mm. Remember all those? I do. Mm -hmm. On those tapes were recordings of Jeffrey Gordon modeling the lingerie that had been stolen, that he had stolen. Oh. He was obsessed with watching himself remove the lingerie in various environments, mostly in his own bed. He also had a video camera set up in the bathroom at his home to watch his guest using the toilet. Oh, God. When questioned by authorities, Gordon revealed that he was undergoing therapy for his compulsion to steal women's undergarments forcibly. (laughs) Not just steal, you know what I'm saying. Like knocking down and taking Mm -hmm. it. But he held steadfast that he had not killed anybody. 
Even after they confronted him with the DNA evidence, he still denied it and refused to confess. Gordon was charged with the rape and murder of Margaret Eby and Nancy Ludwig. Now, a little bit about Gordon. He worked at the Buckler Automatic Sprinkler System, which his parents owned at the time of Margaret Eby's murder. The company provided service to the Applewood estate in Flint, and Gordon was known to work there. He was dubbed Uncle Perv and Panty Sniffer, which that is the first time I've ever typed those words down, by the way. (laughs) Um, Since probably middle school. Yeah. Well, his, I don't think I ever wrote that down. (laughs) But anyway, that's what his co-workers yeah. That's what they thought about him. And yeah. he, oh, wow. They did okay. that because he was, well, his misogynistic and perverse views towards women, pretty much, right? In fact, one of the prosecuting attorneys noticed that during jury selection that Jeffrey Gordon could not stop staring at one of the women who was a candidate for the jury. Oh, that is so creepy. Yeah. So once he mentioned that, Gordon began to squirm in his seat. Gordon underwent psychiatric evaluation at the Center for Forensic Psychology in Ann Arbor, and he was found fit to stand trial. And in August of 2002, a jury deliberated for less than two hours and found Jeffrey Wayne Gordon guilty of murder, felony murder, larceny, and criminal sexual conduct. Gordon, who was just 39 years old then, was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now, Dawn, Gordon's ex wife, who had been married to him from 82 to 1988, was at the sentencing. And she said that for the most part, Gordon managed to blend into a normal life. However, she said privately, the clues that something was horribly wrong had been there all along. She went on to reveal that when she was married to him, she found lingerie belonging to hundreds of other women in their home. As for Margaret Eby's case, Gordon surprised everyone and pled no contest, thereby receiving another life sentence. He claimed he did that during his trial to save everyone involved from the trauma of having to endure another trial. However, the following year, in 2003, Gordon made an appeal on the first case, claiming that he had an effective counsel. He claimed that he only pled no contest because he was so disappointed in how he was represented in the Ludwig case. Gordon was given six life sentences for murder and sexual assaults and will never be set free. Six months after Gordon was charged with Margaret Eby's murder, her daughter filed a wrongful death suit against him, the Sprinkler Company, and the Mott Estate. She claimed that the Sprinkler Company knew that their son had a history of sexual misconduct and allowed him to work in situations where he would have access to potential victims anyway. She also claimed that the Mott Estate had ignored requests from her mother for better security at the cottage she rented. The state Supreme Court said that Eby's family could not sue anybody because, in the state of Michigan, a claim had to be filed within three years of the murder occurring. Now, the state Supreme Court didn't care that she couldn't have filed the suit within three years since the murder had not been solved for almost 16 years. So the lawsuit was dismissed. Can you believe that? No, I cannot. Unbelievable. That's, but yes, thank God he's in jail forever or prison forever. He's never to get back. But, you know, we can only guess that there's probably more victims, right? Oh, totally. Then people just don't want to come forward. Wrestling a woman on the street to get her slip. How many people might that have happened to? And you're like, well, that's you don't want to report that because of just how odd it sounds you know and Mm -hmm. having to deal with the fallout from that well his first murder was in 1986 right and that was just two weeks before he met his first wife dawn and then he didn't murder again until five years later and that was just five months after he and dawn got married Mm -mm 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 -mm. so i don't know i mean it's possible that he could got better with cleaning up everything i don't know Uh, it's just Unbelievable is all I have truly, to say. Truly, truly. You would think that somebody would have, I mean, his nickname and I don't know, somebody would have, I don't know, like he could have gotten caught earlier or you something. You would think that somebody you was know? like, huh, somebody was raped. He's a little odd. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Yeah, I I don't know. It's something. Let me just put it. He's something. And yeah. what's scary about him is how normal he looked. Mm-hmm. Seriously, I mean, he was—he's this nerdy, 
nerdy looking man that looks normal. That's how they get away with it. And supposedly his fetish developed when he was in junior high with his mother's clothing. And then he began breaking into his classmates' home to steal underwear there, too. See, I'm, that's why I'm like, what your mom, d- did the mom notice that? She never noticed that? I have no idea. I don't know. I mean, know. that's not a normal behavior unless it's Halloween, you know, to be trying on. I mean, for the reasons he would be trying that on instead of just goofing off. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I don't know. And then his second wife kind of suspected something, too. But she didn't find out that he had any kind of underwear fetish until she was like nine months pregnant. Ugh. And she found a pair of nylons in their bed. But he just said, oh, I got those for a stripper. I got those from a stripper, which is weird <laughs> to me. <laughs> that doesn't make it better. Uh, um, no, I, but, I would say no. Yeah. But then years later, he started wearing the nylons to bed, she said. Which, Which is, is fine. fine. Yeah, that's really right. that's not the issue here. I think there's a yeah. You know, I mean, if I fish to fry, I mean, God love you if you want to wear nylons. They they suck, but um, hot and yucky. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, unreal, unreal. I'm glad he was finally caught, and I'm glad he's never allowed out. That's all I'm gonna say. Thank goodness. Yeah. Thank goodness. Well, that was uh, that was something. Yeah, it was day two. Day two. So, we're going to toss it back over to me for tomorrow, yep. day, day three. three. And, uh, one, two, three. Yep. One, two, three. Or one, two, uh, three. Hopefully we are helping people, you know, as they bake and clean and cook and getting ready for wrapping presents and all that good stuff. Going Keeping shopping. you a little company. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you're done so with you uh, all those Lifetime movies, or if you're tired of those Hallmark Lifetime movies. movies. Hallmark. Yeah, Hallmark. Yeah, sorry. The holiday. Those nice, sweet Love and movies Aspen. come to us for murder and mayhem. That's right. So. All right. Good job, Jen. Thanks. I guess until tomorrow, we'll see you. Same bat time, same bat channel. Yep. But until then. For day three. Remember, lock your doors. Keep passing by those open windows. Uh, bye-bye. Love ya. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are. Talking about you. Yep. Bye. For more information about this episode, as well as all other sources, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at OurTrueCrimePodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by the hosts, Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Vertese from We Talk of Dreams. You can reach Nico at WeTalkOfDreams.com. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. You can find all of his great works on YouTube. Please make sure to like and subscribe to our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter with the handle at Our True Crime Pod. You can also email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. We would also at this time like to thank our patrons. We would be so lost without you. Thank you so much. And if you would like to help support the show, you can check us out on patreon.com slash our true crime podcast. You can also show your support by leaving a five-star review on Apple or simply just tell your friends about us. It's that easy. Love ya.